also means that about every 45 minutes or so, we get one of these really stunning sunrises or sunsets out the window. Is there any way to turn off the lights that are shining right on the, um, on the screen? My friend, Jeff Williams, he's still on the space station, and he is looking out the window and watching us as we leave, and he very thoughtfully has taken this picture for us to remember that experience by. All in one picture. Now, anybody here inspired by anything? Are you excited by stuff that you're learning? You know, things that you get to do? I'm guessing yes. Look at that, figures up. And I was like that too when I was a kid. Um, I'm very thankful that my parents shared what they loved with me. They brought me to events like this so I could see things and learn things. And by doing that, I discovered what I loved. And my mom, very creative, very artsy. Back when I was growing up, it was the days of macrame, hook drugs, pottery. And if, if she would, could go do that, she would take me and my sister with her. If I was going to get to a ballet lesson, it was because of my mom. And if I was going to get out to the airport, where my dad, who loved to build and fly small airplanes, was usually hanging out, it was because of my mom. And we would spend time out at the airport, and I got to know flying people, I got to know all about airplanes, and I wanted to know not just how to fly, but I wanted to know how things fly. Like, how do airplanes fly? And so because of that, I went off and I studied this thing called aeronautical engineering, and I learned how to fly little airplanes like this, and while I was studying aeronautical engineering in college, I was like, man, if you want to know how airplanes fly, why would you not want to know how rocket ships fly? And by doing that, just following along with what I was interested in, I was able to get a job as a NASA engineer at the Kennedy Space Center. And that's in Florida, and that's where we launch all of the vehicles that send humans to space. And at the time, we were working on the space shuttle program. And I got to work up close and personal with these vehicles. And even more than being able to work with the spaceships, I got to work with all these really cool people who believe that the care and feeding of these spaceships was their responsibility. And they were the people that taught me things like, man, if you want to do complex stuff, like build rocket ships, launch them, fly in space, you absolutely have to believe that there is a solution to every challenging problem. And on top of that, you have to approach things with a here's how we can, not why we can't attitude. And that positive approach, it's amazing the kinds of things we can do as human beings. So this is a picture that is the Endeavour Space Shuttle that had just landed on the runway at Kennedy Space Center. And this is this really amazing group of people I got to work with. See if the red little dot, that's me. Back, way back in the 80s, the late 80s. Wow, that was a long time ago. Um, that was a time of big hair <laughs> and colored shirts. Um, but I love it. I love looking at this and thinking about how all of this evolved over time, really just by paying attention to what I enjoy. Now, I was working at the Kennedy Space Center. I worked there for about 10 years on the space shuttle program and getting all these vehicles ready to fly. And while I was there, I started to see astronauts coming through. And I started to get a better idea of what astronauts even do. And I'll tell you, up to that point, you know, I had watched the first moon landing, you know, Buzz and Neil walking on the moon with my parents on the black and white TV. I have vivid memory of that. And I think even at six or seven, you would know that that's a really extraordinary thing that happened, people walking on the moon. And I always thought, man, this astronaut thing, it's really cool, but, you know, they're, they didn't seem real. Like, why should I even consider it? It seemed like that was something other special people get to do. Why would they ever pick me? And even later, when I was working as an engineer at NASA, I was thinking, now, why would they ever pick me? What have I done? And I started thinking about it because I'm watching these astronauts and I'm like, man, 99.9% .9 of their time is not flying in space. Sadly, to astronauts, believe me. 
About 80% of it, as best I could tell, was a lot like what I was already doing as a NASA engineer. And that's what encouraged me to reach out to a couple people that I consider to be mentors that I've worked with at Kennedy Space Center and just ask them, what do you think about this astronaut thing? That's something I should consider. And they very simply just encouraged me to do the one thing, it's like they gave me permission to do this, the one thing in the whole process that I had control of. And that was to pick up the pen and fill out the application. And I am so thankful to them. I interviewed after that first application. I did not get selected. But they offered me a job at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, where all of the astronauts work and all of the astronauts get trained to fly in space. And for a person who loved flying, wanted to know how things fly, I got to work training astronauts how to land the space shuttle. And I got to fly on airplanes like this one. It looks kind of like just a normal corporate jet. It is anything but normal. It is modified in ways you would never want your normal airplane to be modified. There are thrust reversers deploying in flight. Flaps doing really wacky things. The gear comes down when you would never want the gear to come down normally. And it all does that so that that airplane can be essentially like diving at the ground at about 21 degrees towards the ground which is about seven times as much as what your normal airliner does when it's approaching a runway. And so you're coming in really fast and steep, and then at about 2,000 feet, just like the space shuttle would, you do this flare and then chirp on the runway, go around, start all over again, so that the astronauts can practice landing this airplane that was modified in a way inside, too, where the cockpit, half of it was like the space shuttle, half of it was like the normal airplane, and then I got to sit in the middle of that, kind of direct it all. Really, really cool. And as part of that, I also got to fly in these little T-38 trainer jets, which is what the astronauts also use to learn how to work in a really complex flying environment. So I was already getting like this head start on what it would be like to work in those airplanes. And after about two years, of uh, working uh, on those airplanes and training astronauts how to fly. I was uh, in, able to interview again, and I got selected way, way back in the year 2000, which is long before many of you were even here. And, and it seems like a long time ago. It's funny how it's something that seems so long ago, and yet I look at the picture and it seems like just yesterday, too. But this is a picture of my astronaut class. There's 17 of us in this picture. We are the 18th group of NASA astronauts. Our nickname is the Bugs. And every class gets a nickname. And the class before you is the one that names you. There's kind of this tradition in the, the NASA astronaut office. And we love the name Bugs, because most bugs have wings. What do astronauts want to do? They want to fly in space. So we love the name. And the name is usually meant to be a little silly. And classes before us had names like sardines, and maggots, and penguins. And I mean, I love the penguin, but it doesn't fly, so why would you want to be named a penguin? And we, we thought we were being really nice when we named the class after us. And that was the class name was the peacocks, a really beautiful bird that doesn't fly. So not one of us, not one of us got to this, this place in the same way. You know, we all had different things we studied in school. There were engineers like me, fighter pilots, test pilots, uh, medical doctors, oceanographer, geophysicists, all the things you can think of that NASA might want to pick to be astronauts. And then on top of that, which I think might even be more important, we had artists and musicians, really wonderful chefs, near professional water skiers and race car drivers, mountain climbers, house builders, all of these things that when you mix it all together, you can make a really wonderful, successful crew to fly in space. So, love this picture. As astronauts, um, we get selected, and it's gonna be a few years before you get to fly in space. And it's a lot like going back to school. We learn all about the systems and how the spaceships that we're going to fly on are going to work. 
and we learn about all the science that we're going to do in space, and we learn other languages, all of this kind of thing that's a lot like going back to school. And then a lot of it that we need to know how to do in space, unfortunately we can't fly to space to learn it, right? So we have to do that down here on Earth. And so imagine this building, this, this hall, and you see in the picture, you know, like a big screen around me. I'm down in this little mock-up of one of the modules on the space station. And imagine in this hall, every wall, the ceiling, the floor, everything was a video screen. Kind of like a big video game. And that's where we learn how to fly the robotic arm, the big white crane that's on the outside of the station. And so some of the skills that some of you might have on things like Xbox or PS whatever actually apply very well to um, flying the robotic arm on the space station. And we learn how to do spacewalks and all of these things. And um, in all of what we do, we're somehow, in it somehow, learning how to be better crewmates, how to work as a team, discovering our own strengths and weaknesses, getting put into like challenging situations where we might not normally do that thing and they discover something about us, we discover things about ourselves and how we can work better as crewmates. And so the best place that we go do that, and Mr. S mentioned this, this thing called Aquanaut, which a few of you apparently are, so I'd like to talk to you afterwards. And Aquanaut is somebody who goes and lives for an extended period of time underwater. And in an environment where your body is saturated with nitrogen. So you've been down under long enough, you can't just safely swim to the surface, too much nitrogen in your blood. So we have to learn in that habitat how to work as a crew 60 feet underwater even when something is going wrong. And that's exactly what we have to do in space. When something goes wrong on the space station, we can't just hop in our spaceship and head home. So we have to work as a crew. Um, you also can't just go out the door anytime you want without special equipment on. So on the undersea missions, you've got either you know, hard hat, helmet diving, where we're walking along the surface of the ocean, or we're getting in these big scuba gear rigs and going out, which is just like getting dressed up into a spacesuit to go do a spacewalk. And inside the habitat, which moves which is about the size of a school bus. Um, we could be in our regular clothes. We're doing science experiments just like we would on the station. Absolutely the best analog to living and working in space. And just bringing it back a little bit, you know, you talk about this inspiration. All of that that I just spoke to you about was about preparing to go to space. And I wanted to make sure, my husband and I wanted to make sure that my son, who was seven when I flew the first time, that he knew what I was doing, that he understood the work I was doing, the people I was working with, the people I was going to fly in space with, that he understood what the space station was, all of those things. And so I wanted to make him feel like he was part of the crew. So anytime I could, I'd bring him out to things where, you know, his mom looked like an astronaut. So when we were doing spacewalk training in the big white suit, or learning how to get him in and out of the space shuttle in the big orange suit, or there were times where he could actually get into the launch and landing simulator and land the space shuttle and get a good high five from my commander on my second mission. And then even back to as early as, you know, I mean, he's like teeny tiny little guy, about four years old in the back of that airplane in the top left, just to share what I loved with him and see what he would get out of it as well. Next slide, please. Now in all of that, one day, somewhere along the way, it's a mystery how you get assigned to a crew, when that's gonna happen, you get assigned to fly in space. And my first flight was back in 2009. Our launch was a little after midnight. I could talk all day about this one picture and what it felt like to launch on a space shuttle. The most amazing, dynamic, shaking, feeling like you weigh four times as much as you do um, experience that I've ever had. And I had worked at the Kennedy Space Center, so I watched a lot of these launches, right? I had in my mind, ooh, I thought I knew what it was going to feel like. And in hindsight, those expectations were about here, and in reality, it was like I can't even reach my hand high enough up. You 
I, oh my gosh, you feel like you're getting kicked off the launch pad. Like somebody has just rammed a truck behind you with those solid rocket boosters light. And there's this immediate thing like, oh my gosh, was I ever on a launch pad? And you're shaking like you never could I, The pictures I'll show you later, the video, it's like, that does not show what it felt like to shake inside of that vehicle. It's like jello inside. And you're traveling to space really super fast. You're hoping you're going in the right direction because for about the first minute and a half, the crew can't do a whole lot except for monitor what's going on. And this human reaction to all that energy is seven million pounds of exploding rocket stuff underneath you to get you off the planet. And it's like almost immediately your hand goes up to high five the person next to you. And this smile comes on your face and you're like, woohoo, you know, you want to respond to all of that energy. And it's so cool how from being peaceful, quiet on the launch pad for a couple hours to those engines lighting and in eight and a half minutes, you are orbiting the planet and traveling at 28,000 kilometers per hour. Unbelievable. And both times when I went to space, we went to the International Space Station. Does everybody know about the International Space Station? Yes? No? Well, that's the International Space Station right there. And I just want to pass on. There are a couple um, apps you can look at on your computer or your phone. That uh, one is called Spot the Station, and the other one is called ISS Tracker. And you can go into those, and you can put your city's name, and it'll tell you when the space station is flying over. And you can watch it. You can, it'll tell you where to look to see that dot of light appear in the sky, and then how long it's going to be flying over you before it kind of appears to go down below the horizon. And it's pretty cool to think about that little bright dot of light being this ginormous spaceship. This spaceship that if you laid it on the ground would be bigger than a football pitch. That weighs a million pounds down here on Earth, but in space it weighs nothing. And that it's been flying around Earth, falling around the Earth for over 20 years now. With crew members on one crew, representing 15 different countries, five international space agencies, all somehow working peacefully and successfully on this mission off the Earth for the Earth, where everything we do up there together is ultimately about improving life on Earth. And that's a pretty cool thing to think about, watching fly over your head. And it's a pretty cool thing to think about just in general that this has been going on for over 20 years as an international community. Best example of living off the grid you can find, the space station, absolutely. And we build it, right? You know, we build these space stations, our spaceships, they're like mechanical life support systems. And we build them to mimic as best we can what Earth does for us naturally. So that we, as the warm, fleshy ones, next picture, please. <laughs> so that we, as the warm, fleshy ones, can live and work there, can do the science that we want to do on this, this space laboratory. And so in order to do that science, to do anything up there, we need to make sure that our life support system is in good shape. So every morning, every morning, we wake up as a crew, and we float to the computer, and we call the ground, and we're like, okay, how much carbon dioxide is in my atmosphere? How much clean drinking water do I have? How's my metal hull doing? No holes in my metal hull, right? The health and well-being of all my crewmates. The most wonderful example for how we should be living like crewmates down here on Spaceship Earth. Really simple. Think about it. Get up in the morning, what's my atmosphere like? How are all the people I live with and that are around me? How are they feeling? Um, these are the guys I spent my three months with on the International Space Station. Uh, there's nine people in this picture. Normally we had a crew size of about six. Um, three had come up before three went home. And um, I love it because I look at this picture acting kind of goofy, right? We got clown noses on, we're all floating in different directions because there's no up or down. So you can kind of look at it and get a sense that we had a good time while we were there. We enjoyed ourselves, it was fun. You should enjoy yourself when you're doing really, you know, things that you believe in, that you're working with people that you love. And at the same time, I look at this picture and I'm like, oh my gosh, I knew that when the alarm went off at 3 o'clock in the morning, 
telling us that we had a hole in our space station and there's air spewing out, I knew every single one of these people was going to have my back and would take care of me. And I know that they trusted I would do the same for them. Those are absolutely the best people to work with, the best team, the best crew. A little bit of personality and a little bit of professionalism. It goes a long way. Now, why do we even go to a space station? Why do we want to do science up there? Why, um, you know, why? Why do we want to go to this place where we all float? Well, it's because we can take gravity out of the equation. And everything about our bodies behaves differently. Everything about everything behaves a little bit differently. Everything floats. Even water floats. We float. All of our stuff floats. I mean, the most difficult thing up there is to keep track of your stuff because it all floats. But by taking gravity out of the equation, we can look at things that we thought we knew a whole lot about in a whole new way. So things like the way fuels burn and how we can look at the way they burn together, the components burn together to make more efficient or fuels that burn with less pollution. We can do that in space. We can look at how the effects of space on our body and this, this impact on our bones and our muscles and our hearts and our eyes and everything because of not having gravity involved. We can look at how protein crystals grow, how plants grow, all of these things. And every day on board the space station, there are over 200 active research investigations going on that pretty much cross every area of science you can imagine. Really, really incredible. And we're there as observers, right? That's what science is. It's about observing things and looking at things differently and learning things. And so we do that as part of the science. We do it. And then also, the space station has these sensors and instruments on it that are looking back at Earth and out at space, measuring dark matter and all these things I don't understand at all. And then back at the Earth and measuring the vital signs of our planet so that we can all solve the biggest problems that we have. And then we also are observers just because we're human, right? We want to see what's out the window. We want to look at Earth from space. And I can tell you, if astronauts have free time, this is where they are. They are in this module, we're all packed in there, floating around, you know, looking at Earth, just absorbing it, taking pictures. If you are not a photographer before you go to space, you will become one because you want to capture those memories, not just for yourself, but to be able to share them. And it is incredible the way you can look back at Earth and be like, oh my gosh, I live on a planet. <laughs> it's pretty cool. So when I got to space, I wanted to see Florida from space. I considered Florida to be my home. And it was kind of cool how very quickly even though I always wanted to see Florida, Florida became a special part of a planet. That's my home. And I think there's no denying, when you look at a picture like this, you know, here's Florida, here's planet, there's no denying that Florida's a special part of a planet that's our home. And there's other special places. Like this, what does anybody think this is? Yes, sir. That is South Africa, yes, sir. That is... Kind of the edge of South Africa, it's not the point down here where Cape Town is, but it's this, you know, kind of this uh, line of South Africa, just like Florida with those turquoises and blues and the shape of Florida that you cannot deny. South Africa has these really beautiful cream and pink and browns and tans and, I mean, just gorgeous colors and patterns, and the shape is very distinct. So every time you fly over South Africa, you know you're flying over South Africa. You do not have to look at the computer and say, oh, I wonder where I am. Oh, that's South Africa. You just know. And that's kind of cool to have that experience where you get to know the Earth just from looking at the colors and the patterns. And then I got to look at Earth just kind of like, man, what's the next surprise I'm going to see? Because every time you look out the window, there's a surprise to see. And it looks like a work of art. <laughs> I mean, absolutely, like it was there, like it's this gift to us to experience. And this is my favorite picture that I took from space. It's a tiny little chain of islands on the northern coast of South America called Las Rocas. And to me, when I looked at it, big zoom lens, zooming in, 
it looked like somebody had reached out with a big, ginormous paintbrush and painted a wave on the ocean. And this one picture has become like inspiration for me. It was what I printed out a little picture on a scrap piece of paper and painted while I was in space. I took up a little watercolor kit with me and painted while I was there. And as you can imagine, floating balls of water that you're dipping your brush in versus a cup of water. You're not gonna paint while you're sitting in front of the window, right? Because at five miles a second, whatever you wanted to paint is gonna be gone before you can get the brush to the paper. And just the way everything behaved a little bit differently was really, really interesting to be able to do in space. Absolutely one of the personal highlights for me was to be able to paint in space. It's like we're putting the human in human spaceflight when we do things like that. And since the very beginning of human spaceflight, over 50 years ago, people have bring, been bringing their humanity with them to space, very creatively, with colored pencils, or writing poetry, or playing music, or, I don't know, my friend Karen Niver quilted while she was in space. My friend Dan Bursch actually weaved baskets on the space station. I mean, really wonderful to think about these kinds of things. People that we tend to only think about being technical, sciencey kind of people have absolutely embraced the creative side of their, of their talents as well and are using their whole brains, which I ask all of you, use your whole brains. Bring it all to bear to solve the, the, the problems that we have. And so that chance to paint in space um, was the inspiration for what I'm doing now, coming out and speaking like this, but also working with a group called the Space for Art Foundation, where our motto is uniting a planetary community of children through the awe and wonder of space exploration and the healing power of art. It's kind of space-themed art therapy. And we work with kids all over the world. And Mr. S has actually gotten South African kids involved with our last two projects, which is really wonderful. And we do things like Working with kids in hospitals and refugee centers and orphanages where we collect individual pieces of artwork from the kids. And then the same company that made the suit that I did my spacewalk in, that big white suit, they have been working with us since the very beginning to quilt the kids' artwork together into these art space suits. And a couple of them have even had the chance to fly to the International Space Station where the kids can see their art in space. And here's my friend Jack Fisher wearing the suit. We had kids in mission control, piped it into the hospitals, to other places where the kids were around the world. And they got to communicate with the astronauts on board. And then they got to see their artwork flying through the space station. And I can tell you, I mean, it's, it like touches my heart how this feels when you're working with these kids and when they see this happening. And every astronaut or cosmonaut that works with us on this project, they're like, why can't my suit be all colorful like that? Why is my suit just white? And maybe one day when you guys are all flying in space, we can have colorful space suits. And we try really hard because we know we can't get everything physically up to the space station to do things electronically, to bring the kids' artwork together, always in this kind of planetary community way. And I think when you take these little pieces and put them together, it's always much more beautiful. Now, some quick stuff through just being on the space station and going to space. Here's launch. This is back 2009, a long time ago. You can see some shaking up, and that does not even represent at all what it felt like to shake on that vehicle. We were tracking down the space station. It starts out as this little tiny dot of light that looks like a miniature space station. We're looking in the binoculars for it. As we want, you know, go to meet up with it, it goes from that little dot of light to this ginormous, you know, football field-sized space station. We dock the two vehicles together, which is kind of a cool maneuver, and then we meet all our friends on the station inside. You've seen that picture before. This is my crew from my second mission on the last flight of Discovery. There I am with my buddy Leland's. I don't know what we were celebrating, something really awesome that we did, I'm sure. Um, you know, just floating around with the space station crew. There's the space shuttle Discovery docked to the station. That was in the morning, getting ready for whatever work we were to do that day. I felt pretty confident about it, some tortillas on the wall. Checking out, we had some mice with us on that flight. I brought them up and then took them home with me. We are the experiment, so I learned how to draw my own blood. You know, I mean, they want every output product you can provide frozen and 
set to the ground to study us. Um, there's no up or down, so there I am hanging out around the dinner table with my buddies. Nothing weighs anything, so you can, you know, press your crewmate. They've got somebody is wired up every day to measure whether you still have a heart, a brain, how things are working. Um, plant experiments, absolutely one of my favorite things to have that, you know, that kind of nature inside of the station was really interesting. Um, also, you just move effortlessly. Imagine you could push on your seat and just float up to the ceiling here, roll and fly. It is just the most liberating thing to be able to move that way and how our brains and our bodies figure out just gracefully how to do that. And then, we're not always so graceful, we'll help each other move around in the space station in fun ways, because you can, why would you not? You know, you're in space, you can do it, you can crawl on the ceiling. And after all that recess and having fun, there's serious stuff, getting ready to do a spacewalk. I spent a little over six and a half hours out on a spacewalk helping build and repair the space station. Um, one of the coolest things I got to do, very surreal to go out in your own little personal spaceship and crawl around the outside of your bigger spaceship. Um, this is the point where my mom reminds me, I think Mr. S, you've heard this like 47 times, that she was afraid while I was in space. And in her mind, NASA should have a two hands on the space station rule at all times. <laughs> but you're not going to be able to get any work done if you have two hands. We've got tethers, we're very deliberate and diligent when we're out there and working. Um, I got to not only crawl around, but I got to ride on the end of the robotic arm. You can see my feet are strapped in here, that's me. I'm holding on to a box that weighs about 900 pounds, but it felt like nothing. I never felt like I was even moving when I did that. Um, I got to fly, you see, here's all the hand controllers, looks like a video game. I got to fly the robotic arm to capture this cargo vehicle. It was the first time we had done that, and then we attached it to the space station. And then inside, we opened up the hatch, you gotta get all the stuff out. And then we played around inside and did a little more of this flipping stuff, because you can. Never a good hair day in space. <laughs> But it's kind of fun, because it shows where you are, you know? It's like, here, you're floating here. You don't keep it like that much, though, because there's fans and Velcro, and you don't want to get caught in that. I was doing a video conference with my son's class. He's about seven years old, floating the gummy bears around. Scored some points when I did that. That was good. Um, we don't have any running water on the station. We squirt balls of water out to, you know, to get clean and, um, and to take our sponge baths with, but you can kind of squirt it into your hair to wash your hair. We brush our teeth twice a day at least on the space station, right? Just like you guys do uh, down here on Earth. We exercise two hours a day up there to counteract that bone and muscle loss that happens really aggressively up there. Really, really accelerated bone and muscle loss on, this, on the in this microgravity environment. We were kind of goofing around. Apparently the ground had a camera on us that we didn't know and they were watching us, so it probably seems more funny to me than it does to you guys, but. Um, this is the resistive exercise device. Um, really wonderful piece of equipment that you can do all the major muscle group exercises. We had two treadmills that you can see Frank in one of those videos in the background riding the bike. Um, very effective exercise equipment for us to come back. I actually came back in better shape after my first flight than when I went because who has two hours a day to exercise, right? God bless you. We did haircuts in space. Um, got to take care of yourself in all kinds of ways. And so once a month we would do haircuts. You can see the hose on the end of the clippers. That's because you want to suck all those little hairs up. You don't want them floating around and get in your eyes or swallow them. We had Halloween while I was up there. You know, if you're anywhere for a month or more at a time, there's going to be a holiday. Um, eating food. We ate a lot of food space. A lot like camping food. That's my buddy Al back there scooping something out of the bag. We wrapped everything in tortillas. Um, the food was good. Nice variety. And then one day you have to go home. I didn't want to go home. There's that picture of the cupola module again. And you'll see some that you've seen before. There's Las Rocas. There's painting in space. And there's Florida. All right, you're going to see a couple pictures of Florida. Right, because I love Florida from space. What's that? Florida. How about that one? Florida. Part of Florida going down to the Bahamas. 
another view, there's Florida, end of Florida up in the top left there. Florida under clouds, got to get that view. What's that one? Florida. Yeah, good, very good. How about that one? Florida. Florida at night. Okay, and now this, not Florida, I have no idea where on earth it is, but we're moving, thin line of atmosphere glowing, all these lights that are flashing, that's lightning flashing on the earth. I mean, I thought, I looked at it like, oh my gosh, it looks like neurons firing in a brain. You know, the earth just looked alive from that, and everything is interconnected, and oh, what is that? That's Florida. And how about that? No, it is not Florida. That one, what do you think? South Africa, yes it is. We're looking from north to south. You've got that glow of the atmosphere. You've got some stars up in the sky. And I think we are down here somewhere. Right down there, just gorgeous. I mean, really, really gorgeous. And that's the last slide I have. And with that, I will just remind you, what are you going to be when you leave here tonight? Crewmates or passengers? Crewmates. Crewmates. Thank you very much.